Welcome to this program Top Shot, I am Suresh Prabhu. In this program, we normally welcome and invite a guest from different walks of life who talk to us about some of the very important issues that confront you and me. Today, I am very happy to welcome Dr. R.K. Pachori, Director General of Terry, who is also the Chairman of Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is nowadays in news for really letting the world know about the ill effect of climate change and how is it going to affect our lives. Dr. Pachuri, welcome to our studio. In fact, uh, we are very happy that uh, an Indian is heading such a prestigious body like IPCC, which is supposed to be the largest scientific uh, organization dealing with climate change issues. So how do you feel to be at the helm of such an important organization and actually be at the center of many times a public attention which actually talks about climate change all the time? Well, sir, I actually feel very humble because every day you learn how much you don't know. And there's just such a huge area of knowledge that needs to be explored in this area. And the fact is that the IPCC is able to mobilize the best talent, the best experts from all over the world. So each one of them has such a wealth of knowledge that you end up feeling very humble. But I think the challenge really is to bring everybody together and to be able to get products that come out in the form of the assessment of the IPCC. And I must say, this has been a very satisfying experience. Because so far, you have been the face of uh, India on energy and climate issues. But now, you have become face of climate change to the rest of the world. So it's a very uh, proud moment for Indians and India that uh, an Indian is doing this. Well, I feel like a global citizen because uh, there's every corner of the globe that we need to be concerned about. Uh, you go to the Maldives Islands, you go to parts of this very country where the impacts of climate change are going to be so serious, you feel that you are part of all this. You really can't in any way distance yourself from yeah. what is happening on, on this planet as a whole. And Doctor, you said uh, something very interesting that uh, every time we do new studies, then we come to know how little we knew before the study was carried out. So what do you think now, because uh, whatever we know now, you think the climate change, is it a serious threat to humanity? Well, I think there are a few things that we know with uh, great certainty now. Firstly, the fact that climate change is unequivocal. Uh, global warming is taking place. Obviously, there is no doubt at all. We are also now absolutely certain that the bulk of what is happening, at least what has been happening in the last 50 years, is the direct result of human actions. Yeah. And we also know that the impacts are going to be very, very serious. In fact, they are turning out to be far more serious than was anticipated earlier. So from that point of view, what you've said is absolutely right, sir. The more you found out, find out, the more you realize yeah. how little you knew absolutely. earlier. But you know, now considering the fact that we really know that the challenge is enormous, the problem is very serious, what do you think the response of the world community, is it adequate to the challenge or it is still we are, because there are so many people who are saying that there was an ice age which went away, there were dinosaurs who no longer walk on the earth. That means that climate is changing anyway, why should we do something? You think this is the right response that people are offering to this real challenge? Well, the pity of it is that among human beings also, we have dinosaurs yeah. who, <laughs> who really don't change. And therefore, I think they are going to be an endangered species. Yeah. The reality is that we now have enough evidence. And I think in the last one year, there's been such an increase in awareness yeah. that it gives you some hope. Yeah. Every major leader yeah. in the world now seems concerned. Yeah. And even those who were so skeptical earlier, yeah are now at least believing in the fact yeah. that scientifically climate change is something that human beings are causing and that we need to do something about it. So it, this gives you a basis for optimism, but I agree with you entirely, our response yeah. is much too inadequate at this point of time. And in fact, talking about <coughs> creating an awareness, I think I must congratulate you for doing that because your reports have always been at the center of all the discussions that is taking place in the world and it has really contributed. But do you think uh, dissemination of this such a wealth of knowledge and information that you have created through these reports, is it going down the place where it should really reach the is common man understanding about it? Not enough to be quite honest and 
This is something that I've been very concerned about ever since I've been chairman of the IPCC. One of the things I've been emphasizing is the importance of outreach. Yeah. Now, the IPCC itself can only do so much. That's right. We really need to join hands with partners yeah. Yeah. and organizations all over the world so that they can translate the scientific message yeah. into something that the uh, average person on the street understands. Yeah. Yeah. We're trying to do that. And I must say, this time, the fourth assessment report has achieved that to a much greater degree right. than was the case in the third yeah. assessment I, I agree report. with you because we were yeah. in the parliament, uh, we discussed this issue and we really were quoting all the time from this fourth assessment report. Tell me something, Dr. Pachwari, what do you think about uh, India as a whole? Because, you know, we are part of uh, one ecosystem, particularly the Himalayan uh, range states, right from China going up to Afghanistan and, you know, all of us. We are facing this challenge and because most of the water will be flowing from Himalayas. Do you think adequate studies have been made for that part of the world, uh, particularly for the Himalayan region and the South Asian region? Unfortunately, as far as the glaciers are concerned, we have really not done enough yeah. work on this. But um, I think there is a need now to mount a number of studies that look at the impacts of yeah. climate change on India. Because we'll have a huge variety of impacts yeah. across this country. Given the size, the spread, yeah. the diversity of this country, yeah. we have problems, as you rightly said, sir, in the case of water supply yeah. from the Himalayas. Yeah. Most of our northern rivers are so water tower of the there. world, actually. <clears throat> Absolutely. And that's true of uh, all of this subcontinent, yeah. the northern part of yeah. this subcontinent. It's also true of parts of China. Yeah. So I think uh, we have a shared interest in studying what's happening to the glaciers in the Himalayan range. We have a serious problem with uh, impacts on agriculture. Yeah. Our availability of water is going to suffer very seriously, uh, mainly because we know that precipitation levels are going down in some parts of the country. Yeah. And what's even more serious is that extreme precipitation events are going to grow in frequency and intensity. Yeah. For instance, if you look at what's happened in Mumbai yeah. this year and two years earlier, Absolutely. Now, I'm not saying that's the result of climate change, but, but those are the kinds of incidents yeah. that are going to become more frequent and much more intense. Yes, and all of that means that water availability is actually going to go down. And we are only 4% <coughs> of the water in the world, and that's a real problem. with 16, 17% of the global population. And in fact, uh, talking about agriculture, uh, I think uh, we might get heat both ways because the intensity of water that will be required in agriculture will increase because of heat. On the other hand, the availability itself will be under threat. So, do you think uh, we really need to look at cropping pattern, the agriculture practices and all the issues related to that in a holistic way? Absolutely. In fact, I must say we were very happy to have the agriculture minister spend some time okay. with us. We had invited him over, we made a presentation to him. Awesome. There is a range of things that we need to do, agricultural practices, certainly the management of water for agriculture. And I would say most critically, research and development yeah. by which we can come up with new crops. Yes, because we have to develop crops that are drought resistant, yeah. that are more salt tolerant, particularly yeah. in the coastal areas. Yeah. And perhaps even a shift in agricultural patterns and uh, the mix of crops that yes. we produce. There's a, there's a number of things that are required to be done as far as agriculture is concerned because otherwise we know globally yeah. that food security is going to be threatened by climate change. But we as a country, yeah. I mean, having reached self-sufficiency, yeah. we have to do everything possible to maintain that and possibly generate a small surplus. And two-thirds of the population is directly dependent on agriculture, so that's a real problem. You know, the other dimension of uh, this global warming, which is resulting out of climate change, is uh, energy. Because the way we use the energy and the source of energy that we use, it has direct impact on climate change. Uh, what do you think uh, should be the change that should take place in the energy policy of India, but also of the rest of the world? Well, I think, uh, let me first deal with India. I believe very uh, firmly that while, yes, under the Kyoto Protocol, for very good reasons, we don't have any commitments to reduce our emissions. There are no binding targets. But I think for domestic and local reasons, we have to find a path of development which is sustainable. And that clearly cannot emulate what the developed countries, yeah. say, in North America have That's done. It. We necessarily have to find a path by which we use all our resources, yeah. including energy, much more efficiently. Yeah. And I think this is where India should really set an example. Yeah. And if one looks at the global level, 
I feel that firstly we should be very very active in seeing that the world realizes the importance yeah. of doing something and starts reducing its uh, consumption of fossil fuels yeah. and its emissions and secondly I think at least I believe that if we set an example we would have much greater political and moral power yes. to be able to tell the rest of the world yeah. that look we as a country are showing you the way yeah. you better follow us yeah. and therefore I think we need a rethinking as far as our energy policy is concerned yeah. we cannot start using cars in the way say yeah. North America does yeah. we cannot possibly have buildings that waste energy in terms of inefficient lighting yeah. uh, very poor quality air conditioning very poor insulation so I think a number of sectors require a major shift in the way we design our structures, our infrastructure and use energy. So like we can uh, <coughs> emulate an example set by you in a Terry building uh, near in Haryana, near Delhi where you have put that <coughs> building probably why don't you make it as a model for people can really look at it and emulate it. We are trying and as a matter of fact I must say now Terry is helping a number of organizations design buildings and also we have come up with the rating system called Griha which is an indigenous yeah. rating system okay. by which we will be able to rate buildings in terms of their energy and environmental responsibility. So that's a very real breakthrough thinking about it. Mm -hmm. What do you think about uh, because we talk about energy uh, then the energy mix becomes a very important issue so fossil fuel is one energy efficiency of course will be one of the most important component of that policy but what do you think about renewable energy because uh, we have such a huge renewable sources which we are not tapped enough. I think uh, I feel very sad about the fact that you know we've had first a department and then a ministry of renewable energy for the last 25 odd years and uh, we have not really been able to create the capacity in that ministry to make a difference yeah. both in terms of financial resources and even in terms of what it's able to do yeah. uh, to influence others within the system. I think we need a major step up in research and development and this has to be focused goal oriented research. Uh, just to give you an example this country produces a huge quantity of agricultural residue. Yeah. We should be able to convert that agric agricultural residue into liquid fuels. Yeah. This will take a lot of scientific effort but there is no reason why cellulosic material cannot be converted into liquid yeah. fuels. If we are able to do that then certainly we can substitute a lot of the oil that we are importing. Yeah. We have to use energy much more efficiently yeah. in every sector of the economy. We should use solar energy yeah. even for simple things like solar water heating. Yeah. In rural areas we can use photovoltaics on a large scale, biomass gasification, yeah. wind energy where of course a great deal is happening. But I think a totally different approach is required yeah. to tackling this enormous opportunity that we have for using renewable energy. But you, we have about almost uh, in good part of the country about 300 days of good sunshine and you mentioned solar energy but you know uh, if you really use the present uh, system of photovoltaics and try to do that do you think solar thermal will be a breakthrough for that type of activity wherein we can store some of the energy that is generated and if, if that is so do you think we are putting any money into that as a country because. Not really in fact uh, it's sad that we have had a solar energy center under the ministry for the last 25 odd years and that was meant essentially to promote research and carry out testing of solar devices but uh, I'm not too sure whether it's made a difference yeah. at all but these are some areas where I think the country must put down money and if I may be pardoned for saying this if you do this in the government research system yeah. I'm afraid you'll get yeah. no results at all. I don't want to decry any organization. Yeah. But if you look at the kinds of technologies that have been produced in some of the government research institutions, I'm sorry, the result is really far below expectations. You really need to involve industry. Yeah. You have to provide incentives yeah. and empower those who have the capability outside the system yeah. to be able to get into these areas yeah. and come up with results which are goal oriented and time bound. Yeah. We have to be much more business like in our R&D. Yeah, in fact, uh, it is the typical policy of the government is a dog in the mind policy they are not allowing others to do research and trying to trying to monopolize the whole thing and not producing results so we are absolutely in fact I would also feel that we really need to push 
yeah. this particular approach to do this. Mm. The other mm. issue arising out of energy and nowadays in India there is a huge debate going on is a nuclear energy. Yeah. Because of course it's a cleanest form of energy. But you think uh, nuclear energy's contribution to reduce greenhouse gas emission and what should be the India's approach to include it in the basket of energy? I was very skeptical about nuclear energy earlier on and uh, I think I had uh, solid reasons for being so. But I think nuclear energy has moved on and the technology has developed to a period of time where I think we have to tap it to a much larger extent. Yeah. And frankly, if you look at fuel supply possibilities for this country, we are going to run into some very serious constraints in yeah. the future. And therefore, if we can somehow get an international regime that supports supply of nuclear fuels yeah. and allows nuclear technology to come here, I think we should really go in for nuclear on a large scale. But of course, we have to build in the right safeguards. We've got to create the right infrastructure yeah. so that there is no danger of any mishaps. There is no danger of uh, risks of any yeah. kind. So, uh, but I think nuclear certainly will be an important part of the solution. Yeah. But there are several others that we should be really spending a lot of money on by way of research and development. And I think the country will benefit not only domestically, yeah. but also in terms of exporting some of yeah. these technologies. We'll have a huge advantage over some of the developed countries right. if we got it right. This, uh, normally we focus on mitigation by way of uh, changing energy policy, changing our policies related to transport sector. That is one of the important thing which I've always been talking about as a public transport, as a substitute or as an alternative to the type of transport mode we have. But we sh don't focus enough on forest because who can play a very important role of uh, absorbing carbon, sequestration of carbon. What do you think uh, the government is doing enough to have more forest areas and the type of forest that we have, is it maintained properly? I'm afraid not and I feel very sad because I was born in uh, Nenital and in my childhood I remember the amount of forest cover you had in that entire yeah. region. Today you feel really depressed yeah. at what you see around, no doubt in the last 10 years or so because of excellent environment ministers that we had uh, and leadership that was provided. I think there has been a turnaround. Forests are certainly not being cut down yeah. in the manner that they were earlier. But I think we have to go far beyond that. Yeah. This country has to recreate the natural resources that it's destroyed. Yeah. And forests are so critical. Yeah. And this is true of clean water, this is true of clean air. And I think we need to do a lot more on forestry. I also feel we should shed some of our hang-ups in terms of involving the private sector. Yeah. You can have regulations, you can have means by which you monitor and measure what the private sector is doing. But there are some areas of land where really speaking, unless you provide yeah. access to the private sector to grow trees that may have a commercial benefit, uh, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. But overall, the country would benefit by yeah. that. And, you know, just uh, typically when uh, we talk about uh, abatement of climate change, we have two possibilities. One is technology, which you talked about on many areas. Other is lifestyle, because uh, that's another way you can actually reduce the greenhouse gases, like you don't go the American way and have four cars or three cars per family. Do you think what should be the mix of lifestyle and technology? I personally feel that you need both. Now, in the case of technology, I think there's a mistaken belief that purely developing technology will do the trick. You've got to have pricing. One of the things that we brought out very clearly in the fourth assessment report of the IPCC is the importance of a price on carbon. Yeah. If you have a price on carbon, then not only will industry develop yeah. low carbon technologies, but the consumer and the whole system yeah. will go in for much larger use yeah. of low carbon So you use the markets also you to are. actually make this happen. Absolutely. So I think we'll continue with this talk, very interesting talk. Just stay tuned, don't go away, we'll take a small break.
welcome back to this program Top Shot in which we talk to top personalities from different walks of life on various issues and today this evening we have a very distinguished scientist, a distinguished economist, Dr. R.K. Pachori talking to us about issues related to climate change. So, Dr. Pachori, thank you again for uh, spending time with us. Tell me, uh, uh, you are telling us about uh, the contribution one could make by changing lifestyles to this uh, challenge of climate change. So, what is your view on that? I, I think uh, a change in lifestyles and consumption patterns is absolutely essential because in general, the footprint that hum human society is placing on the ecosystems of this earth is clearly unsustainable. And I think we have to find ways by which we don't give up some of the comforts of modern day living, but do it in a manner that uh, does not impose a burden on the earth's resources. Now, in the case of what we have created in the atmosphere, which is a high concentration of greenhouse gases, yeah. it's now necessary to, to stabilize that. Yeah. Because if we allow these to continue, then the extent of climate change will become much worse yeah. and the impacts will become unbearable. Yeah. So I think lifestyle changes are absolutely critical, whether it's the use of transport and uh, the related greenhouse gas emissions from, say, private vehicles, or the amount of energy we use in the home, the shopping malls that are coming yeah. up really are horrifying as far as I, I'm concerned yeah. because these are all energy guzzlers. Yes. There should be a means by which we construct, if we have to construct shopping malls, we do them in a manner that are energy efficient. We are not doing that. Yeah. And I think there's a whole range of things where human beings have to now start worrying about what they are doing yeah. to the Earth's climate. And this will require behavioral changes on our part. Yeah. And talking <clears throat> about uh, lifestyles, you know, in the Kyoto Protocol, which is in fact an umbrella legislation for international negotiations, in which uh, we talked about equity as a very important component of that, and therefore the poor countries should not bear the burden of something which has not been done by them. But when we talk about uh, lifestyles, in India there is a feeling that uh, paddy cultivation, dairying, contributes to methane emission and therefore that's something which is causing concern. So I think, uh, do you think it's a type of a, some tactics whereby we are actually diverting our attention to the real issues. In fact, they contribute undoubtedly, but the real damage that is caused is not by such activities. Sure. And in case this is something which the poor have to do in India. Undoubtedly, and you know, if you are looking at foods uh, itself, if you look at the beef cycle for instance, and there is a large part of the world that eats a lot of meat, yeah. that is an extremely carbon intensive cycle. Yeah. Because right from let us say the grazing land where one is to cut down trees, one is to cut down all kinds of vegetation to the whole process of killing animals, keeping them in refrigeration, transporting them long distances. Yeah. There's a lot of trade that takes place. I think if you start looking at something like that, yeah. I feel that it is totally wrong to focus on people who eat nothing more than a bowl of rice every day. Yeah, and they have to produce that rice. Absolutely. Of course, there are means by which we should produce that rice by minimizing methane. Yeah. But that doesn't mean we stop producing that's rice. I think that's totally wrong and I would say immoral to even that's suggest right. that. That's right. In fact, uh, I'm glad you said that because otherwise we are actually focusing on something which is totally uh, a non-issue and we are trying to Absolutely. really forgetting the real action where it should be done. Absolutely. You know, talking about uh, this, you said, you know, if you don't do it now, the cost of doing it later would be much higher. So, Sir uh, Nicholas Stern's report which in fact talks about delaying action and the cost of that delay is going to be very exorbitant. So do you think now after that report, your report uh, of both assessment report to IPCC and others, has there been a real movement forward or still we are in the phase of talking about it all the time? I think we really haven't seen any movement forward and I hope it will happen soon. But one of the things that we have brought out in our report for instance is clearly the fact that let's say we want to stabilize our concentration of gases that will limit the yeah. equilibrium temperature increase to roughly 2 degrees centigrade. Yeah. Then all this would mean is a reduction of 3% in the global GDP by the year 2030. Oh. In effect, this means that you are going to postpone the level of prosperity that yeah. you are going to reach yeah. by a few months. Yes, and all this assumes existing technology and technologies yeah. that are being commercialized. There is no reason why between now and 2030 we won't have other technologies That's that right. come in which will actually reduce the cost further. Yeah. 
So, you know, this is really not a high price to pay. Right. And if you look at the cost of inaction, yeah. then you're talking about disaster in That's several right. parts of the world. Yeah. So and you are only <coughs> postponing the prosperity, but ensuring your own survival. Hereby, exactly. maybe you will say that I'm going to enjoy prosperity, but you may not survive at all to enjoy it. Exactly. Plus, what we have brought out very clearly is the so-called co-benefits from these actions. Yeah. Energy security. Yeah. I mean, if you reduce fossil fuel consumption, yeah. you're enhancing energy security. Yeah. The benefits in terms of air pollution at the local level. Yeah. If you consume lower quantities of fossil yeah. fuel, that's a major benefit. And a whole range of other benefits. Yeah. You take the example of Germany, for instance, a country that has gone in for renewable energy in a big way. Yeah. They haven't lost jobs. Yes, they haven't lost output. And they're That's the biggest the export of the world. Exactly. So, <coughs> it's possible that win-win is possible in this. Undoubtedly. Yeah, you know, this is one issue, climate change, in which uh, you can actually have a national debate, a local action. But unless the global community join hands, it is not going to work. And that's why we had the UNFCC first and then the Kyoto Protocol. Kyoto Protocol now needs to be renegotiated, for example, because of uh, the first commitment period coming to an end. So again, the politicking will start. The politics of climate change will take the front seat and probably the science will take the back one. So what do you think, how this should be tackled? Do you think uh, India should take a lead in mobilizing the global opinion, the world opinion? Because India is in the mid of uh, either it's still a developing country, but still not a very poor country that it was some years ago. At the same time, it is not emitting enough. So, do you think India can play a role in this? I think India certainly can play a role, but I think organizations <clears throat> all over the world, including, of course, the IPCC, can play a role in creating awareness. People must realize that there are going to be no winners from climate yeah. change. Each society is going to suffer negative consequences from climate change. And that the cost of action is really very, very low. As a matter of fact, it's a negative cost. There are benefits from it yeah. rather than costs. Yeah, but you know, even then, uh, some countries like United States, uh, Australia, they refused to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. And now we are having going to have a new protocol, hopefully. Uh, and we'll have a negotiation started in Bali, uh, end of this year. But you think, uh, unless these major countries who are not part of this process, they join hands, along with others who have always been committing, like European Union is saying, they'll reduce it voluntarily. So do you think, how do we build this coalition of willing and unwilling? Well, my feeling is, you know, even in countries like Australia and the US, there's a lot that's happening at the local level. I was in Australia a month ago to give the KR Narayanan oration. And climate change is right at the top of the agenda as far as uh, national politics is concerned. I think there's such a huge awareness. They've had six years of continuous drought and they realize the impacts of climate change. And I think every state in Australia is now taking very firm action yeah. to move ahead with uh, taking, taking steps to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. In the US, you have the example of California, yeah. the northeastern state. And Republican governor. Exactly. Someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger, who incidentally we gave an award to this year, the uh, Delhi Sustainable Development Summit, yeah. uh, Sustainable Development Leadership Award. Oh because he's been a remarkable example of Absolutely. forward thinking and action. The largest uh, economy of the United States Absolutely. in terms of state. Uh, this, it would have been the seventh largest economy of the yeah. world if it was a country yeah. Yeah. or something like that. Yeah. So, you, oh. US and Australia, you think, though they didn't join the formally the negotiations in the previous, I mean, ratifying the protocol, but they will be on board, hopefully, in this. So, in that context, uh, you know, we had a very important uh, tenet in the Kyoto Protocol, we said common but differentiated responsibilities. Now there are countries uh, pressurizing India, China, Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, those uh, emerging economies that you must take some commitment. Now you think this is a good thing to say that will it be violating this principle of common but differentiated responsibilities if you ask countries like India and China who are not part of commitments before to take new commitment? Well, I think uh, what we need, sir, is um is some firm action by the developed countries that clearly respects this common but differentiated responsibility principle. And I think they have to show their hand. They have to show that they are really going to take firm action. As far as we are concerned, I believe that there are lots of no regrets measures yeah. which are really not going to cost us anything. I mean, I can give several examples of how inefficiently yeah. we are using energy in this economy. Yeah. I think those measures we should take anyway for local yeah. benefit. Absolutely. And then tell the world that, you know, we are doing this. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose that will create a very favorable impact.